So first off, what I think you guys are focusing on and doing is great. We can do a lot of the science. We get in our own way as human beings and people, the way in the systems that we've built. We built systems for one type of medicine and now we're trying to plug something else into it. And that's where our challenges lie and it's all about what you guys are doing and you guys can pull it off and we need your help to be able to do it. So there are what I wanted to share today was where we're moving, what we're trying to do in, in our imagined reality of the world and really talk about how we're trying to change systems and think of the vision, the vision being that every single patient that runs out of options for cancer has an opportunity for novel therapy. How do we do that? We had the Cancer Drugs Fund, spent half a billion pounds, never acquired any data. Can you imagine if we had the data resource, not only across the NHS, but also around the world, where every bit of data was recorded? This brought value, shared risk, shared investment, therapeutics would be accessible to all patients. The data that would come from that would accelerate therapeutic development, and rather than having four or five percent of patients on clinical trials, we learn from every single patient. We used to do this. We used to do this ages ago. One of my predecessors, Joseph Lister, he developed antiseptic surgery. That is, you wash your hands before you do an operation and maybe spray it with a bit of antiseptic. How long do you think it took the UK community, particularly the Glasgow community where he was when he did it, who were the last people to adopt it? Any guesses? 10 years, five years, one year, 50 years. So it wasn't the science that blocked things. There's something else that causes us trouble. So what I'll present today is really the reflection of three sort of key uh, events and key, th key bits of uh, the things that happened that uh, influenced my thinking. The first was just as I was finish finishing surgical training, I got my ticket, passed my exam, I was still finishing off the last, last nine or ten months, and a young lady came with pancreatic cancer. It was a tiny cancer, she was 39 years of age. And as you are at the end of your training, you're at the pinnacle of your career, and I still think that was the best operation I ever did. She still died 10 months later, even though the tumor was less than the size of my thumbnail and hadn't spread at all. And I thought, really, we don't know what we're doing here, and we don't know how to fix it. So how do we understand what we need to do? The second was, after that event, I decided I can't probably be just a surgeon the rest of my life, and I wanted to cross to the research facility called the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, and I started a PhD. I didn't realize then that what we were doing was personalized medicine. We just didn't have all the right tools. And then, just after I'd finished the PhD, not long after that, the best tool came around, genomic sequencing. Who's heard about the Human Genome Project? So we were, that took 15 years and 3 billion US dollars to do one normal genome, and then the technology advanced so much, we were able to do it for about three or 400,000. And somehow, um, and they still can't believe it in the Australian government, we managed to get about 50 million pounds out of them, and we started sequencing cancer genomes. And that was the harbinger of precision medicine today. We contributed to the International Cancer Genome Consortium, and now we have a data set where no drug is developed today without using that data set in some sense, or shape, or form. The third thing that influenced this was the direction of patients on clinical trials. So it was a company that I founded called Cure Forward about six years ago. The role of that company was to navigate a patient or a patient placement service. And the system, the vertical integration of the system that existed was so broken, it was so hard to fix. That phone call, we used to call that strategic incompetence because it's, if you need to look at these patients and talk to them and understand that, that's expensive. Pharma companies can't do that. They depend on the medical community to do that for them for free, but of course, medical, medical treatment, hospitals are all under substantial stress, and so that's the bit that goes, oh, that's just research. But 50% of patients with cancer still die so maybe research medicine is the best medicine for them. What I'll mention today is really about building the engine. And this is the Glasgow Precision Oncology Laboratory that we set up in Glasgow. The data, therapeutic development platforms. 
How do we bring these data together? How do we align that? And then the knowledge. How do we glean knowledge? Because we're now going to need larger and larger numbers. And how do we move that into the healthcare system itself? And that's through the International Cancer Genome Consortium and this new initiative called Accelerating Research in Genomic Oncology, Argo, and we call ourselves Argonauts. So we don't have to go very far to see what the important questions are in cancer. Patients tell us this. I'm sure you're all familiar with Tessa Jowell. What sort of cancer do I have? Do I need treatment? Can I access this treatment? Which treatment do I choose? Will the treatment work? And what are the side effects? And how long have I got? If we think about that in science terms, how do we use current treatments better? 70% of any, any healthcare budget is spent on the last nine months of life. What does it tell us? It tells us most of what we're doing isn't working. We need to be able to predict that ahead of time. Cancer changes with time and treatment. By the time your cancer is refractory, and you've had multiple different types of treatments beforehand, who knows what that cancer looks like? It's very different, it evolves with time. And also, which ones kill you and which ones don't kill you so we don't over-treat or under-treat? So we have a long way to go. And then, as I mentioned with the vision, how do we do this in an environment that's going to allow us to do this efficiently, effectively, and accelerate how we find new treatments for people? And of course, the ultimate aim, prevention and through perhaps an intermediary of early detection. The father of precision oncology, and I'm biased because he's a surgeon from Glasgow, is a guy called George Beetson who removed the ovaries of a woman with breast cancer and the cancer regressed. The first example of precision oncology, precision medicine for cancer, was actually developed in the 1970s. The most successful therapeutic tamoxifen for any cancer and its, and its subsequent iterations was developed in the 1970s. And in fact, it wasn't even made for cancer. It was made as an oral contraceptive, but some dude called Brian, I can't remember his surname, at ICI, which later became Zeneca, which later became AstraZeneca, thought, well, maybe this might suppress, uh, it might suppress estrogen. So we did just one killer experiment. And for those of you who recognize that as a baboon's ass, that's exactly what it is. And what he managed to do with that he suppressed the perineal flush of a baboon in heat, and that experiment led to tamoxifen. Now, we did that in the 1970s, but we're struggling to do that now. This is, in fact, the natural evolution of healthcare. We know more about the disease, therefore we should respond to it, but we're not doing that. The way we measure differences in disease is far outstripped how we can respond, and we're stuck in inertia in the systems we have currently. We used to look under the microscope, we still do, and it's hard to shift that. I looked at these cancers, grouped them based on cancer. Okay, this is what they look like under the microscope. Mind you, the microscope is a 300-year-old technology. Maybe it's time to move on a little bit. But now, when we look at these at a more genetic, molecular level, we can see that there's great diversity, even though it looks the same. Estrogen receptor targeted by tamoxifen. Why do we identify that? Most patients have it. Therefore, you do a clinical trial, you can understand that. Whereas if you try, there are cancers here that are estrogen receptor positive, but if you test it in all of them, you need, for this 5%, you need a clinical trial of 30,000 patients to see a difference. And that's where the challenge is. How do we match the right treatment to the right patient? The principle of precision oncology. But we need to build systems that allow us to do that. So in 10 years, we'll be wondering where all the big ideas are. Some people will wonder if science is slowing down and we've eaten all the low-hanging fruit. And the answer is yes, because that's the only engines that we've built. We need to build a new engine to be able to address this. So how do we do that? And what's our view of how we get forward? We need to build a therapeutic development platform and then try and get it embedded into the health system. One of the reasons I moved to the UK is that I see that the UK NHS could be the world's largest CRO if basically it got its act together and there was a great opportunity for the UK. So we had to build the system. We had to automate the system and then scale it through global data sharing, the standard sort of things that you do in a business. So I work in pancreatic cancer. It's a terrible disease, soon to become the second leading cause of cancer death, simply because we're not making any progress, and 90% die within a year. And for those of you who don't know where the pancreas is, 
This is the pancreas here, and there's the cancer inside. And a pancreas actually means, from Greek, means eat all. I don't know who came up with that, but it just means you can just eat all of them. Um, so they probably did. And even in other languages, it's a fairly boring name, which is like in Russian, it's Padrulodichnik, which means that thing behind the stomach. So when I was training back in 1996, my senior surgeon puts his hand behind the pancreas. This is the pancreas here. There's the tumor. Looks up at the sky and says, oh, yes. And I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm deciding whether we can cut this out or not, and whether we can resect it. And I went, oh, uh, okay, okay. okay. So, so what do you do? Oh, years of experience, my dear boy, years of experience. I said, no, seriously, tell me what you're doing. Well, I'm feeling the gap between this artery here and that to see if there's clearance. And I said, well, can't we see that on the scan on the wall? Uh, and, he looked at, and he said, look, there's a nice little gap there between the artery and this. Well, of course we can take it out. And he went, piffle. Can't do that, need the fingers, great instrument. And he, he said, okay, smart ass, what should we do next? And I said, well, maybe you, I should, we should take a sample and do a test to see whether this ex patient's actually gonna benefit because 2%, 3% chance, even in the best hands of dying due to, due to the operation, and still 40 to 50% die within a year. So predicting who's actually going to benefit or not is pretty important. At that stage, he suggested that I had a patient to see on the ward and I should probably leave. So it's a major operation, as I mentioned. This is the main blood vessel that brings everything back to the heart. This is, that's the vena cava, that's the aorta, all the stuff going through. This yellowy stuff is, is fat. Um, this blood vessel drains all of your GI tract. Putting patients through this is not a good thing to do. But there is a 20% chance of cure if you do that, and we have tests that could potentially tell us which patients we should operate on or not. But we, you can't protect it with IP. Your test doesn't have a good commercial pathway, and therefore it just has no traction. That's a challenge we need to deal with. We need to get it right the first time. And the reason this is done is because of these so-called exceptional responses. We had a patient here who was near death, and this is just a trace of the tumor growing, not in size, but a marker in the blood essentially two months away from death. Went on a treatment allocated by the treating doctor. Tumor shrunk completely away and the patient lived for five years, almost unheard of. And we were able to unpick through the genome as to why, why that patient responded so well. But to convert this from doing it after the event to before the event is the challenge. This is my boss, mentor, for many years. Sadly, he died of pancreatic cancer. And one of the things we did, because we had all these resources, is because he was part of the project, we were able to go off piste and see what we could actually do and find. So we grew cell lines, we grew cultures in mice, we tested them against multiple therapeutics, we used all the biomarkers we possibly could, and this is just the emergence of, of forward precision oncology, using molecular testing to determine things. And one of the, my other influences is that ba on the, based on this and some reputational aspects, I ran a global oncology consultancy practice where I would treat the well-resourced and well-connected individuals around the world who didn't want to go into the health system because that was going to the supermarket. They wanted to say, well, we can access anything that we want. We want your best opinion and the, rather than getting what they called commercial health care. And for the last six years, we've been focusing on taking, well, taking what I've learned from that experience and democratizing it so every person in the community can access those therapies and those procedures that are potentially going to be useful. And so we built a platform to do this called Precision Pank. That platform was really based on experience in the biotech sector. You discover things, you prioritize where you go, you standardize your preclinical development to, do, to get a preclinical path, you build a platform of evidence, and then you run it through a clinical trial that's efficient and effective, and you aim to find the trial for the patient rather than the other way around. We had to build an engine, so we built the Glasgow Precision Oncology Laboratory that could do detailed molecular and genetic analyses for all of these pillars. And then we would build knowledge banks. And it's not just about the genome. 
all of these omic technologies are really coming to the fore. How do you bring all these data sets together? And some of these data sets are massive. I couldn't transfer the data for 400 patients from um, Australia because it would take 18 months on the internet to transfer it. So we had to cut it to disk and then bring it across. When we look at pancreatic cancer in detail, there are therapeutic opportunities. Some of these have been tried, but because they didn't select patients, you couldn't see a signal. And in fact, this, I, be I believe that we could double the survival of cancer just if we use the therapies that are available now in a better way, but you get stuck. Oh, the patent life's too short. Oh, oh no, the patent's messy. Or, you know, these, once they're gone, nobody wants to develop these drugs anymore, therefore we'll never be able to test these in patients. And that's one of our challenges that we're trying to solve. And now they're deprioritizing uh, therapeutics because they're chasing bigger markets. And many of these drugs that are really good drugs aren't going to be developed. And so we're working on ways where we can access those therapeutics or buy them. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later maybe. Then we start to do some experiments. We such as some laboratory experiments, tasting cell lines that we generated from cancers, looking at the differences of response. And when we get that together, enough evidence to go into the clinic, we have a platform called Primus, where we aim to find the trial for the patient. Everybody is asked this opportunity, and the single greatest innovation one of the guys, David Chang, did is said, well, currently in clinical trials, we ask the patient about a trial at the end of the diagnostic odyssey. He just said, well, why don't we try to start to ask them at the beginning? So we parallel stream those, and the conversation goes something like, well, when it's time to make your treatment decision, if we do this at the same time, maybe the clinical trial is the right treatment for you. And the patient says, are you daft? Why aren't you doing this anyway? Um, it took us a while to get that across the line. And then we start to understand what patients need, where the opportunities are for the patients, and meld them with where the therapeutic assets are positioned, and try and find opportunities for all patients to be able to be part of the Precision Bank platform. This is an adaptive trial design. Many of these uh, studies are for early drug development, so we don't need to randomize, uh, et cetera. And then we understand the funnel. Uh, not a lot of data are around as to why patients don't go on clinical trials. There's some opinion pieces, a bit of data, but understanding everybody that's entered the platform, who registered, how many on the study, and then we aim to give them more and more options. Once they finish their trial, we'll talk to them again. Well, we've got trials, other trials for you now. Are you interested? And then, as I mentioned, we want to move beyond just clinical trials. All these trial-adjacent populations, and there's some early successes with expanded access programs, where it's not a clinical trial, but it's still testing the therapeutic. We needed a robust genomic test. It was one of the things that we needed first off. One of the problems was all the commercial tests, apart from being horrendously expensive, they really weren't consistent. Of all the 1,000 potential things you could measure, only 159 of them were in common. The model also sucked. You send your sample, you wait two months, you never get your sample back again. Uh, they give you a report that every time I get a report, I need to call them up again to say, well, this isn't good enough, I need more information and then they sell your data on the back end. So we need to change that. So we focused on this over the last five years to define exactly what we need to know in a cancer genome to make a practical, affordable test. And we've built this out. So this test is currently being piloted across the NHS in the UK to be the cancer test for every patient. We worked hard with Agilent and others to drop the price from 5,800 US dollars as to what uh, Foundation One charges to literally 200 quid. So that's currently being piloted. And the other thing we need is standardization. Otherwise, we're comparing apples with oranges. So an expanded version of that test, which we work with pharma to help them understand their clinical trial results, um, is now slated to be the standard test across the International Cancer Genome Consortium. There's a bit of politics to get through on that one. And so if you compare this particular test, you can see that many of the current providers, these gray bits are junk. So you're paying for junk information that you don't actually really need. And they're sort of stuck because they've built their tests on five-year-old knowledge, whereas the knowledge has advanced dramatically since then. And then we need to, a better way to share data. 
nationally, internationally, and globally. Even now, there's only one data set that exists of more than one clinical trial of granular enough data to do pooled analysis. And that's a guy called Dan Sargent did this for colorectal cancer. We don't have it for any other cancer type. But when we bring molecular data together, we need to be able to do this to look at similarities and differences and help us move forward. Because where we want to go to is a self-learning health system. Imagine a day where there's a self-learning, self-sustaining NHS, where the information that's generated through every patient's receiving new therapies is of value to the community. Value to pharma, it drops the cost of therapeutic development. And so in that context, we have an opportunity to do that, particularly in the UK. Just to touch on ICGC, the first project, the 25K project, we were able to deliver to the world 25,000 cancer genomes. They were a lot tougher and more expensive to do back then. And no drug is developed today without these data used in some shape or form. But we needed to solve issues in order for us to be able to get to this point of self-learning health system. We needed to understand the pathway. How do we move from clinical trials, platforms, piecing those together? What are the elements along the pathway that we need to solve? We needed robust, comparable clinical data. We needed advanced molecular profiling, advanced analytics, global standardization, and international data sharing. Everybody talks about this stuff, but nobody wants to do it. Are you happy to do this test wherever you are? Oh, yeah, it looks like a great test. Well, let, let's do it. Well, no, I want to do my own test. Um, so at least I felt that ICGC was ideally positioned. So we built out the next concept called Argo, Accelerating Research in Genomic Oncology, bringing together data from platforms, in the first instance, clinical trials, associated molecular data to deliver to the world a million patient years of precision oncology knowledge. Now, I wish I made that up, but Dr. Jack Krendler, who you, who you heard from last year, actually made that up, and I have stolen it with permission. Currently, we, from a standing start around 12 to 15 months ago, we now have 11 countries on board, about 28 projects, and 75,000 promised participants with extensive clinical data, which is the hardest bit to get, harder than a genome, harder than the sequencing a genome, with associated molecular data, either genomic, transcriptomic, any omic analyses that you can, you can look at. That's not where we want to finish. We want to finish integrating health system data through learning what we do from here to get to that point will enable us to do what needs to be done then. If we can't do it here, there is no way we're going to be able to do it in the integrating health system data. I know there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, Flatiron recently got acquired by a couple of billion. Is it going to happen? I have my reservations because the, every, the tripping points along the way are not related to science or tech. They're related to how we look at this and how we view this. And that's why I said what you guys are doing is fundamentally important. And in fact, if you can help us, we'd love it. I'll just finish by saying that there's a lot of people involved in this. It's nice for me to get up and talk, but there's about 40, 50 people in the lab, another 50 direct collaborators, and internationally probably 1,000 to 2,000 people contributing to uh, ICGC and development platforms around the world. And thank you all for listening.